Good evening. Oh, we're going to have a program <laughs> on our last evening of the Melbourne class, and this is 1958, and um, I think we may assume that this little difficulty with our machines is right in accord with the lesson that we will have tonight. But first of all, <clears throat> let us answer these two questions. And the first is, all my life I have lived with a fear of some kind. And then it mentions different fears, and how can I overcome this? Well, actually, <clears throat> uh, there are psychological ways of overcoming it, but I don't know anything about them. And uh, the spiritual way is to develop a faith that there is a God. Now, whether or not you believe it, all fear is atheism. It means a state of mind that has no God. You see, <clears throat> we can face any problem of life, regardless of how severe, and work along with it and succeed or fail. The amount of problems we have is unimportant. And ultimately, whether we succeed or fail is unimportant, because we really have a million billion years in which to work out our salvation. It doesn't all have to be worked out here in one lifetime. If it did, all of these boys that we've sent out to be killed in the war, well, they'd, they'd just have a hopeless outlook, wouldn't they? because before they ever had a chance to get started in life, we sent them out and mowed them down. But <clears throat> as you come into a spiritual vision, you discern the fact that it's relatively unimportant whether a child dies at birth or whether it dies at 18 or 20, or whether we live to be 50 or 60, and in some sad cases, go on to 80, 90, or 100 and become doddering parasites on others. Death isn't a tragedy. Very often, death is a release. And always, death is progressive. at least always where there is not a definite, shall we say, backward state of consciousness, one that's living entirely in the negative, because it has to begin where it is and start up. But ordinarily speaking, death is not the end of life. Death is the beginning of life of another life. And so it is that we can face any problems of existence, physical, mental, moral, financial, human relationships, and make up our mind that that's part of uh, our demonstration to work them out. And uh, do it sometimes with a sense of elation when we win and a sense of dejection when we fail. But that is no excuse to face them with fear. The person who faces them with fear has no God. They are still in an atheistic state of consciousness because if you have a God, 
you know that regardless of what problems you have, you are working them out, and eventually you're going to come through. And at least you have the awareness that there is a something, a God, a principle, a Christ, which even if at the moment is invisible, even if at the moment is not on the scene, you still have no fear because you know in the back of your mind that eventually you're going to work through because you're never alone. There is a God. And so it is when you recognize fear, recognize the fact that you are entertaining a belief of atheism, that there isn't a God, and then you'll meet it quickly. You'll overcome it because you laugh. You laugh at yourself for believing there is no God because you are not an atheist. Whoever you are, you are not an atheist. You are merely, you wouldn't be in this room if you were an atheist. But you are allowing an atheistic belief to handle you and to try to convince you that there is no God. And that's where you have to have a little backbone and be willing to talk right up to your error, talk right up to your fear, and say, here, you're never going to convince me that there's not a God. You're never going to convince me that the sun, moon, and stars happen by accident. You're never going to convince me that apples come from apple trees and pineapples from pineapple bushes and peaches from peach trees just by accident. You're never going to convince me that there isn't a law governing that. You're never going to convince me that there isn't a law of tides that says they shall come in at this hour and go out at that hour. And for a thousand years ahead, they can chart it to the very second. Why? Because there's a principle, there's a law operating behind these oceans. And there couldn't be such a law if there weren't a God, because man has never solved the, the idea of time and tides. Man has never solved the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. Man can't govern any of those things. And if man can't govern them, there must be something that is. And so if you've only come far enough along the spiritual life to have grown away from orthodoxy, which would fool you into believing that there's a God of good and a God of evil, a God who rewards and a God who punishes and a God whose favor you can gain and a God whose disfavor you can gain, if you've only come long enough to know that all orthodox religion is a humbug, and have started on the spiritual path, you've come far enough to know that there's a God, and that God is love, and God never punishes, and God never holds anybody in condemnation, and uh, God never gives one person control over another person. God ne never gives anyone at any time or any circumstance, a control over God's perfect likeness, which I am, which you are. Now, just as you sometimes have to have courage to talk back to your employer when you know that you're in the right, you have to talk back to members of your family and stand up to them when you know you're in the right. You have to stand up to your government when you know you're in the right. You can't afford ever to let your family, your community, your government, your church, or anybody else talk you down when you know you're in the right. The world wouldn't be half in half the trouble it is if people had the courage to talk up to their uh, superiors, as it were, I mean superior in the sense of place or position. So it is. There is such a thing called fear. We fear to be dominated by a tyrant in Russia. 
we have had to fight what we thought was domination in the Kaiser, domination in Hitler. Now we're fighting domination in the leaders of Russia. And uh, you're well aware enough of history to know that these that we now call commonwealths have had to do some very tough talking to the government in England in order to win their complete independence and status as commonwealth instead of colony or possession. Now you're a commonwealth, a common wealth, a wealth in common, partners with England, not colonies, not under England. You're a commonwealth, but you had to fight for it. Every single one of these commonwealth countries had to fight for their status of equality. And that's why you have a prime minister here now, and that's why you have a queen mother coming now, because you have won the status of equality and respect, and you've done it by standing right up and talking for it, not fearing because they had a navy that ruled the waves, not fearing because they were the mother country, but actually standing up and realizing your true identity as uh, men and women of equality with all people. The colonies in the United States had to do it long, long years ago with England. The northern uh, states had to do it with the southern states on the subject of slavery. We all had to get together and do it with the Kaiser. We all had to gather, get together and do it with Hitler. Everyone has to stand up sooner or later and assert their true identity. You'll see that when I read these passages that I've mapped out tonight in the Bible. You'll know who you are and you'll stand up to it. And uh, then you will not permit yourself to be dominated because in the last analysis you're not being dominated by a man or a woman or a country. You're merely dominated by the belief that you haven't got a God to hold you up and support you and carry you through everything. And so, spiritually, my answer is to everybody that has fear, talk back to it. Assert your true identity as equal with anybody, with everything. Only be sure you're in the right and then do it. And understand this. The trials are nothing. Problems are nothing. We all have to face them. We don't only face them when we have a little understanding. The more understanding we get, the deeper the problems we have to face. Or have you forgotten that with all of Jesus' understanding he had to face the crucifix, Gethsemane? Have you forgotten the trials that Peter and John and Paul went through with their high understanding? Of course, they didn't go through those for themselves. They did it for us. Had they been willing to retire from the world and enjoy their God realization, they would have had no such problems. But they set themselves up against constituted authority for our sakes. They violated laws of the land, temporal laws. Wherever they went, they were in violation of the laws. They were in violation of the laws of the Hebrew church to begin with. They were all members of that, but they were in violation. And uh, then they were in violation to Rome. They didn't care how many laws they broke. They were going to give us our spiritual freedom. And they broke laws and went to jail. They broke laws and uh, were burned and were crucified upside down. That didn't bother them what the problems were. They had no fear. They had prob problems, plenty of them, but they had no fear. Oh, no not fear, because regardless of anything else, whatever problem we go through, we go through so that in the end we attain the realization of our divine sonship. Who cares if they go to war and get killed? 
Who cares if they go to war and get imprisoned? Who cares if they go to war and starve if they have the feeling that they're doing it not for themselves but for you, for the world? They don't have fear when they go out. They have problems, but they don't have fear. And so it is with us. You are going to have problems from now to the end of time. And the deeper your understanding, the greater the problems, because the very minute that you begin to have a little understanding, you're going to take the problems of your neighbors on your shoulder by starting out in healing work. You're going to take on the problems of uh, a practice. Then you're going to take on the problems of the community and see if you can't spiritually save them from their own ignorance. And eventually you're going to take on the problems, as we are doing, of capital and labor and of uh, international affairs. And uh, to the world sense, you're even breaking its laws. You're breaking laws to world sense because they don't want us doing spiritual work. They want us going around preaching more taxes and more bonds and more bums. They don't like the idea that we preach spiritual means when they're trying to convince people that the only means is material means. And that brings us problems. Who cares about problems? But let's not fear. Above all things, face our problems, suffer them through, ask our friends to help us with them, but don't fear because that's just accepting an atheistic belief that there's no God. And that's that. Now, would you please discuss I am cause? There's nothing that I can add to what I said last night about that. That I in the midst of you is God, and that's cause. It doesn't mean that a human being is the cause of anything. It means that at the center of your individual being there is something called I, and it is cause. It has another name, consciousness. Consciousness. You really are not a human being. You are consciousness. And depending on what state of consciousness you are, what elevation of consciousness you are, this determines what manner of life you're living. Whether you're living the life of a grub worm, whether you're living the life of a slave, whether you're living the life of a free man, whether you're living the life of a spiritual entity, that all depends what state of consciousness you are in. In one state of consciousness, you could very well be and may have been a slave and uh, just had everybody bossing over you. But as uh, through grace a higher realization came, you asserted your dominion and you became a free man or a free woman. Still human, but free. But as greater light came and your consciousness changed, you all of a sudden realized, I'm not merely a free man or free woman. I'm a spiritual man or spiritual woman. I have God-given strength and God-given dominion and God-given freedom. And you are living on still a higher plane. If you keep on going, eventually you reach the place where Jesus was when he said, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. He hadn't always been at that state, you know. At one time he was just at the state of other Hebrew rabbis in the temple. But he grew and he grew and he grew until he realized, why, no, no, I'm not going to stand on that platform just reading out of a book. And then he came to the passage where he read from the book of Isaiah and said, now is this day fulfilled. I have been ordained to preach the gospel, to comfort the mourner, 
to heal the sick. And he stepped down from that platform and he went out into the world and uh, became not a temple rabbi, but a world rabbi. And then later, all that passed from him and he was no longer the rabbi, he was master. Master, they addressed him. Earlier, they addressed him as Rabboni, rabbi, but later, master. So it is. They address you once as housewife, and someday they address you as practitioner, and another time they're going to address you as teacher, and if you keep on ascending one day, they'll address you as master. Do you see that? It all depends on your state of consciousness. And uh, if you have advanced this far to reach this point, it means you're already on the spiritual path. And that means that if you just don't get satisfied someday when you find yourself healthy and with enough supply and say, uh-uh, I've arrived, don't rest with that. Keep going. Keep going. And then one day you, you won't call yourself a housewife and neither will anybody else. But they'll be thinking of you as their practitioner and then someday as their teacher. And if you keep on going, uh, there is no limit to where you can go because there is no limit to consciousness until one day it stands in its fullness and says, I am God. But that's all a matter of development. Now we will go to some passages from Scripture because I've given this lesson tonight the title of The Message of the Bible. And I would like you to see that message of the Bible so that you'll know for all time how it is that regardless of the fact that there are 66 books written by Hebrews in all states and stages of consciousness right up to the most enlightened of Christians nevertheless they all tell the same story and that story is of that which is invisible so that we do not think too highly of ourselves and remember with humility that regardless of what we may be or how high we may come, it is only by the grace of God and through the presence and the power of God, for we of ourselves are nothing. We of ourselves, as men and women, male and female, we are nothing. But by the grace that flows through us, you'll see what we are. And this is the book of Jeremiah, the prophet. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, did you notice this? To whom the word of the Lord came. There's the beginning of the secret of the message of the Bible. The word of the Lord must come in order to lift us out of the ranks of being nothing but ordinary men and women. The mass, the rabble. That's all we are of ourselves until the word of the Lord comes. And then something happens. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and as I read this, will you try to reach back inside of yourself as if a voice inside of you were saying this to you. Then you'll catch the meaning of it. The word of the Lord now is speaking to you and it is saying, 
Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And now, Philippians. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And this is Isaiah. See how all of these prophets had the vision, and it's all the same prophet, whether it's Jeremiah, Paul that I just read in Philippians, Isaiah. It is always the same. It is God that worketh in you. It is I, the Lord, that put the word in your mouth. And here says Isaiah, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth. And the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. How can anyone fear who knows this Bible? 
to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. New things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs, and I will make the rivers islands, and I will dry up the pools, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. Even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, yea, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes, and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this? and show us former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses, that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, It is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, 
I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the watercourse. The message of the Bible is that there is a God. This God formed thee, not only spiritually, actually physically, before you were in the belly, before you were in the womb, before you came forth from the womb, God is your creator. If it weren't for that, we would have no right to expect perfect health through God. But it is the fact that as God created the heavens and the earth, so he created your bodies. And that's why it says that God will quicken your mortal bodies. Because God gave you your body, and your body is the temple of the living God. And so it is that yet in your flesh you will one day know God. You will know the harmony of God. And you will do all of this by realizing that I, in the very midst of thee, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, shall never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And so it is, when these trials come, the deep waters, you will not drown. The fire, the flames will not kindle upon you. If, if in going through the forty years of the wilderness, if in going through the waters and the flames, you will always remember that God in the midst of thee formed thee, maintains thee and sustains thee, and by the grace of that God you are free. You are the image and likeness of spiritual freedom and completeness and perfection by the grace of God. You will learn to let the Lord speak to you within you. Not once do you talk back to God. Not once do you tell God what you want. Not once do you complain to God. Not once do you tell God that you fear. But always you turn in, acknowledging any problem of the moment, but realizing, whithersoever I go, I know that God goes. In the valley of the shadow of death, God goes with me. Through hell, God goes with me. And it is that that enables us to face our problems until they're not problems anymore. Until we realize that those are the opportunities that are given us to surmount in order that we may come to the realization of this God ever-present, always available, infinite in power, love, and grace. And so it is one day when we are ordained to heal the sick and comfort the mourner that we have to go through the world of infinite troubles and sometimes it's wearisome. Often the master had to go away to be by himself, sometimes forty days, with the weariness that he took on from those who were drawing at him, pulling on him. But always he came back refreshed, and ready to take up the burden again. Whose burden? Not his. He had achieved his spiritual freedom. He took on himself the burdens of the people who were being misled by their church. He took upon himself the burdens of those who were crushed by the weight of the Roman Empire. 
He sought to bring them their freedom, and some of the very ones he was trying to bless and free turned on him. It wasn't only Judas Iscariot. One man alone couldn't have done all that harm. But it was those who were willing to cooperate with Judas and all the other Judases. Those who were willing to doubt. Those who were willing to misunderstand. Those who were willing to believe that he wanted to wear a crown for his own personal glory. Be assured of this, nobody will ever wear a crown serving mankind. More likely it'll be a cross. And if he gets a crown, it'll be in the worlds to come, not this. Those who take upon themselves the yoke of mankind, service to God through man, they need every ounce of God power, every ounce of support from those on the path. And never forget that you will one day be one of those who will hear the Lord speak in your ear and say, go this way, go that way. Go to my people. Go to the nations of the world. Carry this word of life. And you will do it. And you will have problems, but you won't have fear. You'll have problems. Sometimes the weight will be more than you can carry. But you won't have fear. You'll know why you're doing it. And you'll know that regardless of the earthly scene, there is a spiritual one. Never forget that. Every generation that has sent men out to war have had to remember that their children who bore the burden of death, injuries, insanities, at least had to look forward to wearing a crown of glory for their sacrifice. Not on earth, but in another world. So it is. You have burdens to bear, family burdens, community burdens, tax burdens. All right, bear them. If you have to cry a little about it, cry a little about it. But don't fear, for I am with thee, and I will not leave thee nor forsake thee. I will be with thee unto the end of the world. This is the message of the Bible. This is what the Bible is saying from Genesis to Revelation. There is something called I. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I knew thee before thou wast in the womb. The Lord knew thee. And he knew thee all the way through from the womb to the cemetery. Do not fear. Grumble and complain once in a while. It's good. It gets it out of your system. But do not fear. All fear is the belief that there is no God, that there is no purpose to a life on earth. And that is what you must learn. There is a purpose. There is a reason why you were formed in the womb. Don't ever think for a moment that it was an accident or that your parents were responsible for it. They weren't. They were only the instruments used by God to bring you forth into this world. Never think for a moment that your parents created you or that you have created any children. That too would be a form of atheism. You have never been parents of children. You have only been the instruments through which God delivered his children to earth and not for your purpose, and not for your glory, for his purpose, and for his glory. And that is why as soon as we wake up to that, we begin to realize that we weren't created for the things that we think we were. There is a divine purpose in our being here, but we'll never discover it 
as long as we think we're just men and women created by our parents. No, then all we can ever hope to be is just some human children. But the moment you begin to understand, call no man on earth your father. There is one that is your father, the one in heaven. And the moment you begin to realize that and to know that your parents were merely instruments used by God to get you here on earth, that you yourselves have only been instruments used by God to bring your children here on earth, you will commence to understand the meaning of a divine purpose and why it is that in 66 books there are hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of individuals who heard the voice of the Lord that made them prophets, saints, sages, seers, and saviors. Why, as bad a person as Saul of Tarsus, that persecutor and killer of Christians, even he could hear the voice of the Lord and become the great, great Christian disciple. Nobody can ever be so unworthy that they cannot be lifted up to the heights. How? by a recognition that there is a divine creator. From Genesis to Revelation, you read about the creator who created man in his image and likeness, who created the heavens and the stars and the suns and the moons and the oceans and the fish therein. And you realize that even the fish were created for a purpose. Even the birds were created for a purpose. Everything on the face of this globe was created for a purpose, a divine purpose. And then you'll see how we come into relationship with each other. Because now we do not treat each other as human beings. Now we look upon each other and say, just think. The same Father that created me for some divine purpose has created you for some divine purpose. Now you'll understand that we are a commonwealth. We are a common heritage, a joint heritage, a united heritage. We're not separate beings, nor is anybody over us except the Lord that formed us. You'll understand the meaning of that then? Yes, indeed, you will. <clears throat> and you will know then that regardless of your problems, you can bear them. And if you go down under them, it's all right too, as long as you do not yield to fear. Because in fear, you lose your God. God doesn't lose you, but temporarily you lose your God. And life's a pretty terrible thing to a person who loses their God. Life must be an awful thing walking up and down this earth just wondering when the next accident's going to come along or the next germ or the next something or other. It's an awful thing. And yet, when you have your God, you don't even care when the next bomb comes along because even that, Paul tells us that even that can't separate us from the love of God. Neither height nor depth, nor things to come, nor things that were, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So why worry about problems. If you have received your copy of the February letter, you already know that the subject is problems aren't problems anymore. And they aren't when you have God. They're just these things that we meet as we come to them. Get over that hurdle and on to the next step because we are divine beings with a divine message. And I'm trying tonight to point out to you what Jeremiah saw, what Paul saw, what Isaiah saw, what Jesus saw. We are divine beings with a purpose. God has spoken into our ear and given us a mission. This is really true of everybody on the face of the globe. But you notice that he spoke there about those who have ears but didn't hear. The deaf who have ears. The blind who have eyes. What good are they? None, for they do not know yet 
that there is something inside themselves capable of speaking to them, ordaining them, commissioning them as prophets, saints, and seers. And there have been female ones in the Bible, too, as well as male. No, no, the message of the Bible is that you are nothing of yourselves. We are nothing. We are nothing except as the Lord speaks in our ear. We are nothing except as the Lord holds us by the hand. We are nothing. That's why it even says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You can't even claim a possession. You can't even claim your bank account. You can't claim the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And all you have to do is release everything in that way. And then all of a sudden you hear it bounce back with, but son, all that I have is thine. And you'll understand then how you have everything while having nothing. Just like you have your integrity and yet you can't look at it. You can't see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, or smell it. But you have it, and you have it in the fullness that you wish to claim. And so as you release your supply and say, Why, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. The heavens declare his glory. The earth showeth forth his handiwork. We well, are acknowledging God in all your ways. And then you'll demonstrate what Jesus revealed in the 15th chapter of John, that keeping this word in the midst of you and living in the midst of this word, that you will bear fruit richly. It is your Father's will that you do this. He words it better than I do, so let's look up the original words. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. That's one of the finest passages in all this Bible. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. If we weren't fruitful, if we weren't successful, healthful, harmonious, God wouldn't be glorified. God couldn't be glorified turning out failures. God couldn't be glorified turning out dead mortals. God is glorified in the harmony of our being, just as God is glorified by the beautiful light and the stars and the sun and the moon. God is glorified by the fruitage on the trees. So God is glorified in the fruitage that we bear. We only show forth God's glory in the harmonies of our lives together. So it is. The message of the Bible is there is a God, that this God is closer to you than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Whithersoever thou goest, this God will go. And uh, that without this God, we are nothing. But in the conscious remembrance of God, we are fulfilling the purpose for which we were created. And that's something to remember, that each one of us was known before we were in the womb. We were known to God. We were ordained. We were made a prophet unto God before we were in the womb to serve God's purpose in one way or another. And then the, every day we have to ask our, the, ourselves the question, Am I showing forth God's glory? Is there something more I need to know 
and then learn to listen and listen and listen and listen until that Lord speaks to us like it spoke to every character in the Bible. The Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord spoke to Joshua. The Lord spoke to Elijah, the still small voice. The Lord spoke to Elisha. The Lord spoke to Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Jesus, to John, to Paul. You see, it wasn't just one favorite that God had. The Bible is full of those favorites. God spoke to King Solomon. God spoke to David. As hard a man as David was in many ways, nevertheless, he was able at times to hear the voice of God. And certainly Solomon heard the voice of God. And the whole Bible is a testimony of the fact that men who were willing could hear the voice of God. Mary heard the voice of God. The mother of John the Baptist heard the voice of God. Esther, Queen Esther, heard the voice of God. Ruth heard the voice of God. Her mother-in-law heard the voice of God. Everyone who attunes themselves can hear the voice of God and hearing the voice of God you are the servant of the Most High you are an instrument for his use and without that we are nothing nothing then as we go out about our work we are upheld sometimes with fainting footsteps But we're upheld. To know the will of God, <clears throat> to hear the voice of God, means, above all things, developing the practice of having many periods of solitude every day, going into the inner sanctuary. Now, I know, of course, as well as you do, that the first argument that comes to you is, but I have no time. Others may have, but I haven't. And of course, that isn't you saying that at all. That's the devil using your tongue, and you're letting him. Because it has been discovered from the beginning of time that everybody on the face of the globe has 24 hours in every day. So there isn't anybody in the world that has more time than another. We all have the same length of time, 24 hours. It just depends what use do you wish to make of those 24 hours. You know, <clears throat> sometimes I think of my life like this. I wish you could see it this way. You'd, you'd enjoy it. I'm not out here where you think you're seeing me. I'm sitting way back up here looking out through my eyes. That's how I live practically all of the time, looking down and out through my eyes. And you'd be surprised in that detached sense what I see out there and the funny things I see and the funny things I hear. And uh, not knowing that I have a sense of humor, you don't know how I chuckle sometimes inside. Now, we have learned, first of all, that there is this God and that it's ever available right where we are in any circumstances. Don't forget, it's just as available when we're going through the fire, when we're going through the floods, when we're going through the hurricanes, when we're going through... Uh, the valley of the shadow of death, it's just as available. Don't turn your back on it because you're in a problem. 
that's the time to reach out uh, harder than ever and uh, we've learned that it is God that worketh in you and so when the going gets very tough that's the time to relax not the time to tighten up that's not the time to get fearful that's not the time to get tensed and strained that's the time to relax and realize I don't have to do this it is God that worketh in me it is not the whirlwind it's not the hurricane the storm that reflects God it's the still small voice it is the gentle Christ and so we come to that final word from Genesis to Revelation we have God and the presence of God and the might of God and the power of God and the strength of God but as we come toward the end of the Bible from the New Testament on from Matthew on we begin to learn a new word and that word is the Christ I can do all things through Christ I live yet not I Christ liveth in me and there we come to a word that defies definition or analysis or interpretation even it's a word that you have to take or a term that you have to take just as it is without any explanations without any appeal to the reasoning mind to understand it for the more you try to understand it the less you'll have of it the more you can accept the term the Christ without question without any desire to analyze it or understand it the more of it you will have the more you try to mentally probe the less you will have scripture tells us that there are four temporal kingdoms using metal, metals as a base but we know that it means the forms of matter and that these four temporal kingdoms will be destroyed and then it tells us that they will be destroyed by a rock that is carved out of the side of a mountain without hands that's pretty nearly as ridiculous as you can get a rock carved out of the side of a mountain without hands will fall on the four temporal kingdoms and crush them well you see even though you could not analyze such a statement or humanly reason it out still you can spiritually discern that there is that which is invisible and infinite which takes from all material form its power so that in our consciousness we understand that the power is not in the form but in the invisible creator of the form now that statement doesn't mean that the world is going to do away with gold or silver or brass or atomic energy it doesn't mean that at all it means that the Christ is going to take the destructive element out of the forces of this world and govern them that's what it means now you have already seen that done for instance in the case of electricity where the mind of man governs electricity and its uses and its activities 
harnesses it for its for man's purpose the mind does that in the same way right now you are witnessing that atomic force is being harnessed and someday will be harnessed not to destroy man but to serve man and so the destructive force will be out of atomic energy and atomic energy will be a gentle little lamb governed by the mind of man the mind of man that very rock on which our life is based the mind which has no material form and yet it's the source of our intelligence or the seed of it or the avenue of it that mind will harness every bit of this atomic power and uh, eventually atomic power will be just as gentle a lamb as electricity is when it's properly hooked up and they'll be servants of man not destructive elements but constructive elements, servants of the mind of man. And so it will be that one of these days you will find that every form of matter, take gold, gold which today dominates and rules man. It buys men's souls. It isn't a day of the week when men and women aren't selling their souls for gold or the equivalent of it. it's gold or its equivalent money that governments are using in this attempt to destroy each other or conquer each other money which is in that sense a devil will someday become just a pliant little thing in our fingers that we ourselves will use and have complete dominion over and it'll never be able to buy us or bribe us but we'll be able to use it not to hold on to but to transfer and use for our purpose gold will be tamed so that one of these days it will be nothing more or less than an instrument for our use just like streetcar transfers that we don't hold to have any value bus transfers that we don't use to have any value so it'll be with dollar bills or pound bills they will no longer be powers the the power of the Christ will crush all power out of money as a force and it will become just a tool, just a servant that we can mold to our use. And so you're going to find one day that all forms of matter are literally going to be under our feet. Germs, we'll have absolutely no fear of them at all. No fear of them at all. We will have conquered them. I'm thinking right now of an illustration <clears throat> where for many, many years the Eskimo of Alaska was subject to tuberculosis and to such a terrible extent that the uh, medical facilities of Alaska were inadequate to care for it. And... Uh, a law was passed permitting these Eskimo to be brought down to the states for treatment and, and you know within just three years in uh, three years time tuberculosis had been so conquered that they have been able to disband the sanatorium and give it up and have no further need for it and the very little remaining uh, tuberculosis that there is in uh, Alaska is so little that the local authorities can handle it and take care of it. Those germs have become subdued. They're no longer the master of the Eskimo. They are the servants. They no longer master them. So it's going to be with all forms of disease the disease will not master us neither will the calendar the calendar is one of the worst enemies of mankind there is because every time you tear off a page it's like tearing up part of your life 
There goes yesterday. And fewer tomorrows. But that won't always be. That won't always be. A calendar will someday, someday be man's friend. And he will be in such complete control over time and the passing of time the time will have no effect on his mind or body whatsoever and then instead of man dying out with either disease or age when his time comes to go into a higher experience he will make the transition the same as a child goes into the adolescent period and the adolescent goes into the maturity period and then uh, we go into the middle maturity period. So we will just keep on making transitions from one stage to another. But that won't be while the calendar has power over us, or why, while germs have power over us, or while money has power over us, or while bullets have power over us, or bombs. It will be when we have dominion over the four temporal kingdoms when we through the Christ through the gentle spirit the still small voice will be able to say thus far and no farther thou couldst have no power over me unless it came from the father now you can begin to demonstrate that any day of your life that you wish you can't prove it to its fullness because that comes with time and maturity and experience. But you can begin as of this very moment. And just remember that within you there is this gentle Christ, which may be called the still small voice or the voice of the Lord. And that as you develop the capacity to hear it, to listen to it that it becomes dominion over everything on this earth above the earth or beneath the earth the dominion that was given to us in the beginning when we were the image and likeness of God unto man was given dominion over these four temporal kingdoms everything in the earth everything in the sky, everything in the waters beneath the earth, and everything in between, man was given, God-given dominion over. And the means of that dominion was the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord came to Adam and Eve. The voice of the Lord came to Moses, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. The voice of the Lord gave Moses dominion over those horrible experiences in Egypt the voice of the Lord gave Jesus dominion over food over health over death itself the voice of the Lord does all of these things there's a psalm you can look it up in your concordance I've forgotten which number it is but there is a psalm that is devoted almost entirely to the voice of the Lord and what the voice of the Lord does. And you'll be surprised what the voice of the Lord does. And in it you'll find also, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. That's the uh, four temporal kingdoms. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. All problems disappeared. All uh, dominion over us was met and we were given dominion over these things and so you see when people say that they haven't time for it don't believe it any more than when they say they can't afford this or that it's just a matter of what you wish to use your time for or what you wish to use your money for we can afford anything and everything that we truly wish and we can find time for everything for that that we really wish to find it for there was a period in my life when I was preparing for this work not knowing that I was being prepared for it but I was being prepared for it 
when I could go through 12 solid years with an average of no more than three and a half hours sleep out of every 24. For 12 solid years. And I required no more sleep than that. And the reason was uh, that I had to have all of those hours in use. In those 12 years, I read the 1,500 books that have become part of my consciousness. In those years, I read some of those books through a hundred times from cover to cover. I really read, and all the time, worked 12 hours a day as a practitioner doing the healing work, and then for part of that time, even went to the university to learn Sanskrit. So you see, there is time, because there are 24 hours in every day. But how much do we wish to use it? If we wanted to use 20 hours out of 24, I can assure you that the grace of God would sustain us. Because it isn't sleep we need, it isn't bed we need, it's the grace of God we need. In the same way, we could get along on half the amount of food we consume because the grace of God would make up for the difference. We merely eat as much as we do because it's available and because it's tasty, not because it's necessary. We can do with half if we have to and be just as healthy if not healthier. For the grace of God has to be called upon when there's less of material reliance, just as those, as you already know, who have come to science and been told that they had to throw away their medicines, they got along without them. I know that the rest of the world wouldn't believe if it knew how many people there are who go 10, 15, and 20 years without a drop of medicine, without an aspirin, without a cathartic. The world would never believe such a thing because its physical setup is such that it must have aspirin, it must have cathartics, it must have this and it must have that as a minimum. And just think of all of us that you know about that have gone 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years either with none or with so little that it's almost negligible. And then you'll know that it is possible to do away with that medicine cabinet because the grace of God supplants it. I know sometimes there are some doctors who smirk about the subject of Christian science or spiritual healing and like to tell about how uh, they have a patient who's a Christian scientist that sneaks to their office or had to have an operation, or maybe they have two patients. But they forget about how the tens of thousands of those who don't or that maybe even that one had to succumb once in a lifetime. That they don't stop to remember. That even though a Christian scientist or a New Thoughtist or a Unity student or an Infinite Way student may once in a while have to resort through fear or family to material remedy, compare it with the rest of the world and see how wonderfully the grace of God cares for us in place of material remedies. And then you'll know what I mean when I speak of the Christ. The Christ, that gentle presence which is the grace of God in our experience, how it carries us through. And how, when we learn to listen to it, hear it, and obey it, it finally gives us dominion over disease, over germs, over unemployment, over unhappy human relationships, gives us dominion. And then you'll understand why the day will come when that rock carved out of the side of a mountain without hands, that gentle Christ, that Spirit of God within your consciousness will someday give you dominion over every element of human life, including time, age, death itself, you will have dominion. And so should the time come when you want to pass out of this plane of existence, you will. But not through being pushed out with some horrible disease, but just by gently easing yourself out and into whatever experience lies before you, because there is an experience that lies ahead of all of us. It is not going to be given to anybody on the face of the earth to stay in this plane of life forever. If there were such a thing, I'm sure that 
some of our ancient Hebrew and Christian and Oriental mystics would have done it because they lived their life, their lives in full conformity to the will of God. Men like Jesus, men like John, men like Paul, men like Moses, men like Enoch, Isaiah, Lao Tzu, Buddha, Shankara, those men lived in accord with the laws of God. And if it had been meant for anybody to stay on this globe forever, they would have remained right here in physical form, but they have all walked out of this form into whatever experience was ahead. And so will we when our appointed time comes, and it will be a way of transition, a transition into a higher plane of consciousness, one in which we will be freed of all the human ties and human responsibilities and uh, human obligations. While we're here, we can't shirk those, but the day will come when we'll be released from them into the ability to walk our own way in the footsteps of God. And we'll do this, remember, through that thing called the Christ, or the Spirit of God in man, or the gentle presence or the still small voice. Call it whatever you will. It is within you. It is available to you through an inner hearing. It is available to you through an inner seeing. Not the hearing of the outer ear, not the seeing of the eye, but through an inner seeing and an inner hearing and an inner feeling, that presence becomes alive. Now, you may have to have four periods a day and then six, eight, ten, twelve, twenty eventually. They may be one minute in length and some of them may be three and some may be ten minutes. Occasionally you may find one to last an entire hour in which you will sit in stillness and in quietness. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. The assurance that David had, the assurance when he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the assurance that comes in stillness, in quietness, in peace, in tranquility. You develop that. The reason is you have become separated from it by your centuries of human living. You have become separated from it through the belief that you had to earn a living by the sweat of your brow or keep a household with your physical strength. And now you're paying the penalty in a sense of separation from the still small voice that is always within you, ready, able, and willing to speak, to lead, to direct. And now you have to go back. You have to retrace your footsteps to the Father's house. And I can tell you how, through the many, many periods a day in which you determine to take mastership of your clock and not let your clock tell you that you haven't time, but you tell the clock that you have 24 hours of time and loads of minutes in that 24 hours, count them up 24 times 60, and see how many you've really got there to set aside your period, even if it were 10 minutes before the rest of your household were awake, if it were five minutes after the men folk left the house, if it were five minutes before sitting down to that lunch or that dinner, if it were ten minutes before retiring, if it were just a few minutes waking in the middle of the night, you would soon find that you are developing a capacity to be still, to be quiet, to be listening. Nobody can tell you whether it will take you one week to receive the first intimation that something has happened or whether it might not be, like in my case, it took eight months. Eight months of more than a dozen periods set aside every day for meditation 
And still it took eight months before I had the first response. But then I had the second one a week later. And I had the third one probably two weeks later. And then a fourth one one week later. And then gradually two at one week. And then eventually one every day. And so on until now, most of the time it is possible for me to sit as you see me here, get quiet for a minute, and then all of a sudden have it come. And quickly, and quickly. Give me my message, or give me my word, or give me my Bible passage. Don't be surprised if I tell you that it was riding in the taxi between the hotel and here that these three Bible passages were given me that I read tonight. While we were riding in the taxi, I had this Bible in my hand, and I kept fidgeting with it, and that's when it came. And then as I sat here and turned within quietly every once in a while, the message kept coming and coming and coming. It isn't made up message. It's not memorized. It keeps coming in the degree that we turn in. Oh, sometimes I have a little struggle because in my work, we're all day long and sometimes all night long. I'm dealing with the problems of students and patients, and some of them are pretty nasty problems. Sometimes you get pulled down off your high estate, then you have to build yourself back up again. Sometimes people come into your experience who really pull almost everything out of you that you've got of a spiritual nature. That's all right. You can rebuild it again. And if it blesses them, you don't mind it. But it does give you something because, to meet because you have to build back up again to where you were. Master did by going away for 40 days. We ought to go away much more than we do for this rebuilding. Now, the whole of it, the whole of it in uh, the Master's teaching is the Christ. He called it the Father within, but Paul called it the Christ. And uh, the Father within, or the Christ, that's the voice. And that voice, the Word of God, is quick and sharp and powerful. And when that voice utters itself, the earth melteth. The whole four temporal kingdoms of the earth melt. I have seen all forms of sin and all forms of disease melt away when that voice spoke within. I've seen all kinds of human wrongs made right when that voice spoke within. I've seen such power in our union relationships in the States, company and union. I've seen such things as you cannot imagine. Just by that same voice that gave me these Bible passages for this lesson tonight, that same voice. It's the voice of God and we call it the Christ. It's the gentle presence. It's the calm. It's the inner assurance or tranquility. It's the grace of God. Call it any of these names. But be sure of this, that until you have it, you are nothing. You are just aging human beings. You are just nothing branches cut off from the tree that withereth. You are nothing until you have a contact within yourself. When you have, you've made contact with living waters, the streams of life that renew and renew and renew just like they renew your plants year by year, year by year. Water does it. Only this is a living water that is within us, and it is that which gives us command over the four temporal kingdoms. It won't allow money to be our masters. It lets us be masters over money so that we can command whatever of it is necessary for our legitimate needs. It won't allow the body to master us forever. The Christ enables us to master not only our bodies, but as in the experience of Jesus and our practitioners, 
even to govern the harmony of the bodies of those who come to us for help. It won't allow us to be made victims of the blitz as I brought out to you the other night, but you can walk the streets in the midst of the blitz and it will not come nigh your dwelling place if you're abiding in the secret place of the Most High, if you are maintaining your contact with the inner being, the Christ, the Spirit of God in you. If you ignore it, if you refuse to make your contact with it, if you don't have the stamina to stick with it until it does take over your life, you just have to do it in the next life. Someday or other, you're going to be assured of this, that every knee is going to bend. Every head is going to bow to God. So if you put it off in this lifetime, don't think you can put it off in the next or the next or the next. Someday, you're going to have to look a clock straight in the eye and say, you've got 24 hours of 60 minutes each, and brother, I'm going to use you. You are not going to use me. I am going to use you. And uh, then it is that you'll find those five and ten minute periods when you can seat yourself and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. My fate is not out there in the whirlwind, in the fire, in destruction. My fate is in the still small voice within me. And when he uttereth his voice in me, the earth of problems just melts away. And I'm going to learn to be still. And I'm going to learn to listen. I'm going to develop the knack. I know you might tell me in a year or two that you haven't done it yet, some of you. And all I'm going to answer is, what difference does it make? You still have another year or two or three or five. We, we don't have to be in as much of a hurry as uh, we think. It isn't the youth who have done all the great things in life, you know. It's some of those who didn't attain until they were far up above the status of youth. Jesus did his mighty works in his youth and passed out of this plane of existence when he was 33 already had completed his work on earth. Well, in 1875, when the first edition of Science and Health was published, Mrs. Eddy was 55 years of age. And uh, she completed her work at 90. When The Infinite Way was published, I was 55 years of age. So you see, it, it, everything isn't done by youth. Lots of things have been left for us. So there's no hurry. No hurry. If you can't learn to meditate properly this year, keep at it. Next year and the year after, you'll get it. And when you do, remember this, that you will have overcome the four temporal kingdoms in some degree. No longer will this world have entire mastery over you. <laughs> you will have begun to have mastery over many things of this world. Little things to begin with, greater as time goes on. And always remember, we've had great composers at 80, great inventors at 80, great artists at 80. Time means nothing, years mean nothing, Longevity really means nothing. There's no particular credit in living to 90 or 100. Lots of people have done their work at 30 or 40. Some of the greatest mystical poets passed on before they were 40, 35. Longevity isn't everything. The developing of our maturity is, and if we attain our maturity at 30, that's fine, but if we don't attain it till we're 60, that's good too. And if we come into the fullness of it 70 or 80, that's good too. Because we, we have forever, nobody is ever going to become extinct. 
Always remember that. There is no such thing as extinction. Passing on is not extinction. Passing on is merely going from one mode, one state of consciousness of life to another. So there's no extinction. And the degree of your spiritual development when you pass on determines where you begin on the other end. Just the same as where you were spiritually when you came into this plane determines where you are now. And if you're not further along than you ought to be, it's because in your last life you hadn't made the most of your opportunities and gone far enough spiritually. So it is. The further we go spiritually on this plane, the further we find ourselves spiritually advanced on the next. And we keep on that way until the day comes when we come into the fullness of our spiritual vision and never have to be reborn again. That is where it is said in uh, Scripture that there is neither birth nor death. That is in that ultimate consciousness when we have attained full dominion over the four temporal kingdoms and all matter is our servant and has in no wise any power or jurisdiction over us, then there is neither birth nor death. So it is. How are we coming along here? Better shut it off for a little bit, eh? Now you will understand when you read the Infinite Way writings why they are built completely on Bible texts. The Bible has the word of life. Now the Bible and the truths of the Bible won't do anything for you in a book. They won't do anything for you even after they're moved over into my books. These Bible texts only begin to work for you after you've moved them out of the books into your consciousness. Whether you move them direct from the Bible or whether you move them from my writings with the explanations around them makes no difference. But don't believe for a minute that the Bible as a book can help you or my writings. It is only as you lift them out of the book into your consciousness, dwell on them, ponder them, as if they were seeds that you were planting in your mind, and then letting them take root, then letting them grow, as you water them and fertilize them each day by renewing them, pondering them, thinking upon them, there you have the way toward uh, the life of dominion. Now, <clears throat> I have a book in preparation which I, I'm sure will not be off the press this year. We have so many other things that have to be done before that can be properly edited. It's all written, but it has to be edited. And it's rather shocking in nature because it explains some of Genesis and how it is that we have become human beings merely by accepting the belief of good and evil. Well, you spoke before of fear. But you see, if there was neither good nor evil, there'd be nothing to fear. You'd recognize that nothing in this world had power, since all power was in God. And then you'd be right back in the uh, Garden of Eden, before the fall. The only reason that we're human beings at all is because we've accepted good and evil and uh, we exult over the good and we fear or hate the evil. And that constitutes humanhood. When you no longer exult over the good and no longer fear the evil, you're no longer human. You are the child of God that was created in the image and likeness of God in the beginning. You can gather that 
from God's words to Adam at a certain period of his development when Adam hid himself and God wanted to know why I'm naked who said that thou art naked who told thee that thou art naked uh huh good and evil has come into the mind huh one part of the body is all right and the other part isn't the other part isn't why who said so who said that thou wast naked but well, nothing except the belief in good and evil that's all if it wasn't for that belief in good and evil who would care whether they had clothes on or clothes off if the weather were right but no 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 we have accepted the belief of good and evil and with it we've accepted sin disease death lack and limitation and we're never never going to be able to overcome our humanhood until we have overcome the belief in good and evil and are able to face any situation in life without a belief that it can be either good or evil since all the issues are not in things but in the within this well in the same way in this book you're going to read about the Sermon on the Mount in a way that you've never in your life read about it it doesn't appear anywhere in any of the literature that we know of because it came to me through revelation what the master was saying in the Sermon on the Mount and incidentally it came to me in a in a shocking manner too it came to me on a Wednesday night in the Chicago class when uh, I was talking about something or other and all of a sudden stopped and then all of a sudden the whole secret of the Sermon on the Mount poured itself out I'd never heard it before never known it before never thought of it before never had spoken about the Sermon on the Mount in any of my work and then all of a sudden out it popped and I was receiving it at the same time that the students were but since then as I've had time for this revelation to work in me I have clearly seen what the master was driving at in the Sermon on the Mount when he said ye have heard it said of old and then he told you what the old Hebrew life was like but then he said I say unto you and now he begins to give you the Christ truth that we've been speaking of here this evening the Christ truth in which you don't have to fear anything that's external to you whether it's a calendar or a person or a bum resist not evil I say unto you you have heard it said of old that you should fear but I say unto you fear not resist not evil there's anything in this world that can do harm to you well we haven't attained that but that's what we have to attain in order to be able to live the Christian life the Hebraic life is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and get there first with the biggest bomb but that's not the Christian way the Christian way is resist not evil there's nothing in this world that can harm you all you have to do is live and my word and let my word live in you and you're completely free of any harmful effects from anything from any person from any condition on the face of the earth you'll be shocked shocked when you learn more about that sermon on the mount but so it is it's all based on one thing my entire life from the very minute that I had my first spiritual realization has been based on the term the Christ even when I had no idea at all of what it meant or how it functioned or what the Bible said about it that has been the little gentle term inside of me that has motivated and governed my life the Christ and I've known that in proportion as I did nothing the Christ could do all things through me and it has done wonders as you've seen with this infinite way and it's going around the world it does wonders it does separate and apart from it 
I wouldn't want to face life. I'd rather have it end very, very quickly than ever have to think of living my life separate and apart from that little thing that I keep feeling inside there that I realize is the Word of God, the Spirit of God. I can do all things through Christ. I live yet, not I. This Christ lives my life. But the manner of attaining it is the listening ear. It is those periods of meditation which you have got to take. It's the command of the clock that you've got to have. Then when you have command of the clock one of these days, you'll have dominion over the calendar. You'll not have to fear the passage of time. And I think that is where we will leave ourselves tonight. Steal silently and gently away.